The talk you're about to hear on the artist Jacob Landau's Stained Glass Windows, The Prophetic Quest, is by Dr. David Herstrom, president of the Jacob Landau Institute. He has published articles on Landau's art as well as on William Blake, and with his colleague Andrew Scrimger, has completed a book, The Prophetic Quest, The Stained Glass Windows of Jacob Landau, available from Pennsylvania State University Press next month. The artist Jacob Landau, whose photo you see here, belonged to the first generation of artists in Roosevelt, New Jersey, which included his friend, the nationally acclaimed Ben Shawn, who was instrumental in Landau's moving to Roosevelt in 1955. Few artists can claim that as teenagers, they won a national art competition and captured the attention of the press. Fewer still can add that the prize included an unusual bonus, a one-person show that toured the country with stops in San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, and New York. Jacob Landau can make that boast. Born in Philadelphia in 1917, he grew up in a leftist-leaning Jewish household and showed prodigious artistic talent at a very young age winning the national competition at age 17 and a scholarship to the Philadelphia Museum College of Art. Graduating from the College of Art, he went on to achieve wide recognition, exhibiting in prestigious galleries, winning numerous awards, and having his work purchased by America's leading museums, such as New York's Museum of Modern Art and the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Revealing the injustice of the world and speaking out, both as a maker of images and as a teacher of art, were the objectives that informed Landau's life from his youth to his death in 2001. Honored both as an artist by the National Academy of Design and as a teacher by Pratt Institute, of which he was Professor Emeritus. Landau spent a lifetime creating images of joy and despair. From chamber works, such as his Holocaust Suite, to a symphony, the Prophetic Quest, 10 Mammoth Stained Glass Windows, which I'll be talking about today. The artist invested each with a rare intellectual and emotional intensity. The Prophetic Quest, featuring 10 Hebrew prophets, which Landau began in 1970, completing it four years later, can only be truly experienced by entering the Knesset Israel Synagogue in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, just outside Philadelphia. So imagine standing before these glorious windows, each five feet wide and 20 feet high. I've had the privilege of visiting them many times over the years, and each time I find myself in awe. Blazing colors, sensuous lines, and the sheer grandeur and authority of these monumental windows stun us. You notice there are two waves of windows, one to the left and one to the right. The first, as we'll see, a challenge to God himself. The second, to humankind. I'll return to this challenge and the artist's shift in emphasis from wave to wave. But first, imagine yourself viewing the waves of these monumental works that move some to tears, I've heard, others to rapture. For none, however, are they a serene experience. Seductive rhythms transport us. Sharp, initially baffling images unsettle us. We simply cannot view these windows as we would decorative paintings on a church or temple wall. Their majestic sweep casts a spell, yet questions us, causing a shiver of unease because we are invited to enter the artist's images, making companions of them, and at the same time, we're confronted by their fire, and we want to back away. Clearly, the windows of the prophetic quest challenge us, and we're compelled to take Landau's commitment as an artist seriously. Art not tied to individual growth, to humanity and life, he says, is dangerous because it lulls or amuses without altering consciousness. 
His aim then is nothing less than to alter our consciousness. And this returns us to his title, The Prophetic Quest. A most serious title, indeed. We have to admit, clearly, the artist is not out to merely amuse. Instead, he has designs on us. Landau's title is carefully considered. It warns us, in effect, that we must avoid the temptation to reduce his epic windows to one message, a single comforting interpretation that lulls us. Pointedly, Landau called his epic the prophetic quest, not the prophetic word or message. This raises a couple of questions. First, what does the prophetic mean? We see the prophets, each named at the base of their respective window, from Abraham to Isaiah on the left and from Jeremiah to Malachi on the right. But why these prophets in this order? And second, what is their quest? What is the story or stories unfolding here? We can't answer these questions, of course, apart from the work itself. But it's worth keeping in mind something of its genesis. When Landau won the commission to create the Knesset Israel Windows in 1970, a dream project, it was not only a challenge on a collaborative and architectural scale he had never before attempted, but it was far beyond an ordinary work. It was, in fact, monumental art in an unfamiliar medium. Stained glass. The collaboration alone involved the synagogue, Knesset Israel, its rabbi and art committee, the stained glass artist Benoit Jussoul, who had worked with Sean, now selecting the glass to match Landau's choice of colors, 100 different colors, as well as their cuts, and the Willett Stained Glass Studios, the atelier that constructed and installed the windows. Collaboration, yes. You could just imagine. But Landau was given complete freedom to choose his subject and develop his images, reserving the right as an artist to veto any suggestions by the synagogue that he judged harmful to his conception. The resulting richness and disturbance of the prophetic quest did not appear in a sudden vision but were the culmination of a long struggle, the curve of a life and career occupied by a concern for justice, which is why this project seemed to Landau something he'd wanted to do for a long time, and why the subject he chose, as we've seen, was 10 Hebrew prophets. Although raised in a secular household, never a member of any synagogue, Landau came to identify with the prophets because, like himself, they were concerned with justice and injustice. To him, they were rebels who defended morality independent of priests and even God himself, whose style, the artist concluded after studying the Hebrew Bible, was anger. The irony is that a spiritual humanist, as Landau called himself, lacking a background in Jewish liturgy and observance, let alone a belief in God, created one of the great religious works of our time. His title, Quest, suggests some sort of story, of course, but viewing Landau's monumental work, we are captured not by stories at first, but by the exhilaratingly intense and expressive images that tell the story cascading images that pull us into the work and make demands on us, at times uncomfortably, such as Elijah plunging head first, Elijah facing downward, pitted against Jezebel facing upward, the hero sinking, the villain rising, the world of human justice turned upside down, and images that push us out as in Amos, the threatening lion at the top of the window, which disturbed the Knesset Israel Art Committee, who wanted it tamed, though Landau prevailed, as we see. Or that make us smile, as does the rock band in Amos at the bottom of the window. No doubt, as Amos says, making the noise that God complained about and wished would cease. 
and images that elicit our compassion, as in Ezekiel, the tied hands, or revulsion, as in Jeremiah, a severed head held in his hand, or images that give us hope, such as the rainbow halo at the top of his window. The artist then gives us an astonishing variety of biblical and contemporary images, some we would expect such as Elijah's famous chariot, but others are something of a shock, like the helmeted man in Malachi, something of a science fiction superhero. Significantly, we see almost none of the traditional Jewish symbols, such as the menorah, that we would expect of synagogue art, Landau being committed to bringing the prophets primarily as individuals into our consciousness, rather than as bearers of religious tradition making them by the power of his images a human presence in our time and life. Which is why we cannot evade their unforgettable faces and hands revealing a range of human emotion. Such as the portrait we see in the first window of the work, a burdened and somewhat perplexed Abraham. And in the last window, Malachi's steely intensity, to say nothing of the pathos we'll see later in Job. Inescapably, we are pulled into a powerful force field of joy and despair in the presence of these works, heightened by the paucity of traditional images. So, his windows are not Bible illustrations, but visions the prophetic quest as a result being both complex and simple. On the one hand, the myriad postures and elaborate gestures of its human figures, as we see here in Abraham and Malachi, demand a reading, as do their unpredictable English and Hebrew words. On the other, the parade of prophets is straightforward, their presence rendered in bold colors and confident lines, as we've seen. Yet nothing is merely pleasant or pretty because we are caught up in a vision that makes demands on us. We are not allowed to be passive, succumbing to inertia. Everywhere we look is the body in action. From Isaac's upward thrusting, his head bent back, arm holding a shofar, to the downward cascading of Elijah, to the writhing Job, his body twisting upward from the bottom panel to the woman's hip. The image, then, that dominates and controls each visionary window, as we see, is the body of the prophet. Landau believed, as did the English poet and painter William Blake, the head sublime and the genitals beauty, which we see Jeremiah display boldly in his window. By Landau's expressive lines, sinuous and static, delicate and bold. He etches in our mind the postures and movements of the prophet's body, each having a unique power in the unfolding of their story. Clearly, the artist viewed the human form as paradigmatic, embodying all human values, including freedom and order, hope and despair. The body necessarily asserts itself as the place where pain lives with hope. It is for Landau the nexus of human suffering and our imagination of a world free of suffering. And it possesses the power to proclaim such a world. The prophetic quest is a vision then rooted deeply in human utterance. The cry of despair out of suffering, such as Abraham's desperate question addressed to God himself, will you indeed destroy the righteous and the wicked? And the noise of joy and liberation from suffering in God's words to Job, adorn yourself with grandeur and majesty. Appearing in each window such speaking images, English and Hebrew words, offer guidance amid what initially may feel at times like a chaos of color and line. Familiar biblical texts comfort the viewer, such as Isaiah's, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. Or verbal visual images slash the colors like thought daggers, as when Abraham confronts God himself. Will you indeed destroy? But where have you seen these speaking images before? 
Yes, of course, in comic books, the familiar word balloons that virtually define the comic book. Landau carefully orchestrates their positioning from window to window, as you may have noticed, demanding that we attend to the text, the words of the prophet. So the windows are, in fact, visual verbal works, which is not surprising given Landau's experience drawing Captain America as a young man, and while in the army in World War II, creating the military comics Sniper with its familiar word balloons and hero figures floating in the unique comic book space. Some on the Knesset Israel Art Committee questioned the appropriateness of using such an art form in a house of prayer, concerned that it trivializes or mocks. But Ezekiel himself uses this composite art when in chapter 37 he picks up a stick and writes on it and on another and then joins them into one, holding it up for the people as an emblem, a speaking image of the tribes of Joseph and of Judah restored to one nation. Typical of comic book art, we also see everywhere in the prophetic quest a fictitious space free of gravity, the space in which the prophets appear, having no familiar context such as a landscape or horizon, providing freedom of movement. And the prophets themselves, their postures and gestures dominating the visual space, suggesting comic book heroes from the cosmic giant Elijah plunging into our world, as we've seen, to the all-powerful Jeremiah we saw striding into our city. The speaking images provide a way to navigate Landau's space with its sea of colors, such as the word balloons in Abraham floating on the brilliant reds, as well as a way to navigate the rhythmic waves in constant movement, such as the balloons surfing the sinuous lines in Elijah, delicate, echoing the still, small voice of Hebrew in the first panel. And static, bold ones, I have found you, in the second panel, etching in our mind the gestures and postures of the body moving in comic book visionary space where anything is possible. These word balloons, which help us navigate the colors and waves of the artist's fictitious space, also play off the window structural limits heightening the prophet's internal conflicts. The fixed verticals of their frames and the rigid horizontals of their saddlebars dividing each into six sections, panels, which coyly suggest the panels of a comic book. Look at the words in Malachi, lively, visual elements in themselves, a dance of forms. The word behold, isolated in the second panel with Malachi's head as in a comic book. And one below, two word balloons, one from his mouth and one from his hand below, emphasizing the present and the future, respectively, announcement, behold, an action, send. Finding ourselves, then, pulled into the force field of visual verbal images, we are compelled to read them and discover the story or stories they tell. What announcement? What action? We want answers to our initial questions. Quest for what? Why does Landau choose these prophets? Abraham, Elijah, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah in the first wave on the left, and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, second Isaiah, Job, Malachi in the second on the right. And why this order? What is Landau's vision of these prophets and their role? Answering these questions, we discover why Landau insists on the freedom of movement and insistent drama of line, color, and word, why the human figure dominates, and why the mix of biblical and contemporary images in Landau's windows. The prophetic quest was a threshold work, Landau having come to explicitly identify himself with the prophets. The entire curve of the artist's life bent toward revealing the injustice of the world and speaking out against it. Memories of the unemployed he had seen in the streets of Philadelphia as a teenager aroused an anger that he shared with Amos, 
raging at those who trample upon the needy. Landau knew from his reading of the Hebrew scriptures, as well as Martin Buber's prophetic faith, and William Blake's works, that prophecy was mainly devoted to protesting the follies of the day, and its predictions were rooted in the present. As his favorite Chinese proverb says, if you don't change direction, you might end up where you are headed. The prophet does not predict the future, but reveals the present, witnessing injustice, condemning it, and proclaiming alternative directions. Action. Isaiah's words in his first chapter pierce the artist's heart. Seek justice, undo oppression. And hope lies in knowing that another path can be chosen. So, the central story of the prophetic quest is announced in the first window, Abraham, where the question that drives the entire sequence, whence comes justice, confronts us in the image of the great downward pointing hand at the top and the upward yearning body of Isaac. The struggle for justice is emblematized in this gyring downward from the carnage in the bottom panel of Abraham to the rainbow shards at the top. The rising serpent becoming a striving human figure. But then the question hits Abraham. If God condemns both the righteous and the wicked, how do we know that the judge of all the earth, Yahweh himself, will do justly? as the Hebrew word balloon asks. Is God's hand, that is, its index finger rigid as the barrel of a pistol, which we see in the bottom panel, aimed at Abraham's head, one of judgment or forgiveness? Is this the hand of God, the accuser, denying justice like the serpent, Satan, the rainbow of promise shattered? Or of the honest judge, God, measuring out justice, sparing Isaac's life. It is by these questions that Abraham introduces us to the central story of the quest, being that for justice. And this window announces the burden of the first wave of the windows, Abraham to Isaiah, the five windows on the left of the sanctuary. Does justice come from a God who acts justly? This is why Landau chose Abraham, who is not traditionally regarded as a prophet, to launch his succession of prophets in time. The second wave of windows, Jeremiah to Malachi, the five windows we saw on the right, answers this question, no, and shifts to another. If not from God, from where? And the answer lies in human action itself. In his preparation for this work, Landau entered into a dialogue with the prophets. His conversations with Job challenged the artist like no other prophet, because this story of an innocent man does not shy away from revealing a serious charge against God himself. Job questions whether suffering, which God inflicted gratuitously, having taken on the form of the lion we see in the fifth panel hunting him down, questions whether his suffering can be reconciled with a just God. No wonder, Job says, I am full of confusion. We would be too. Yet looking at this window, what catches our eye first? The curves of a voluptuous woman's body, her head, a blossoming lotus flower from which emerges a naked bay. The lotus stems curve flows upward from a falling male body into an ascending female body of brightness like an Indian goddess's in the upper half of the window. Something of a daring image for a synagogue. And furthermore, they are the same body. Job rises in joyous majesty as a woman after his tragic suffering as a man. Most puzzling. We're confused. But by this androgynous body, Landau expresses Job's dilemma. Having been faithful to God's law, he expects God to act justly, but finds that God does not. So the burden of justice shifts to Job. Ironically, God, expecting 
him to act justly and become, as Job does in this window, symbolically, the figure of Lady Wisdom. In the book of Job, chapter 28, and in the first chapter of Proverbs, as Landau knew, where she's a prophet. God tries to explain to Job, out of the whirlwind, that there are two kinds of justice. Divine justice, distributed in creation, which Abraham, though bewildered, accepts. The subject of the first wave of windows. And earthly justice exhibited in mankind's social interactions, which Jeremiah and second Isaiah embrace, subject of the artist's second wave. Job's religion offers a reasonable God, but Job does not recognize this God either in his own life or in the world. Thus, the Job window answers the Abraham window. No, God does not always act justly. The hand at the top of the window can be the pistol hand of the accuser, who is Satan in the book of Job. And this is why the artist chose to include Job in the prophetic quest, who in the Hebrew Bible was not included in the company of the prophets and placed him in a pivotal position, the penultimate window of the sequence, the denouement of the story they tell. And the Malachi window, last of the sequence, answers the Elijah window. Yes, humanity can turn from injustice and embrace justice. If God does not act justly, as Job reveals, then justice can only derive from human hands. Justice in the world is thus up to us, as the window's word balloons tell us. God invites Job to adorn himself with grandeur, entreating him to accept this awesome responsibility on earth, doing justice by treading down the wicked. He must rise in majesty to his grandeur task, as the isolation of this syllable in its balloon emphasizes, being wisdom itself and giving birth to a just future represented by the babe in the lotus flower. He must gain his independence as man, becoming fully human by acting in the world to effect justice. Thus, yes to Elijah's question. Will man deal justly with man? Is fraught with difficulty, however, because like God, there can be no guarantee. We're given a promise in Malachi. I will send you Elijah. But even this promise is of another promise, that after Elijah's coming, it remains for us to fulfill the promise of justice. Acting justly toward each other demands sacrifice. It is not enough to witness simply recording injustice, but to witness by speaking out against it. The prophets tell us, fighting to stop injustice. The two waves of windows framed by Abraham, Elijah, the first and the second prophets of the ten, and Job, Malachi, the ninth and tenth prophets, penultimate and last of the series, relate both tragic and transcendent trials in the story of the struggle for justice in our world. This is a journey in the quest for justice from the hand of judgment we saw poised menacingly above Abraham's head to the child of promise we see in the rising sun over Malachi. On this note of hope, in conclusion, Landau's dialogue with the biblical prophets, being painfully aware that the body is ultimately at stake in the struggle for justice, demanded a visionary art, seeing the artist exquisitely modulated distortions, such as the uncanny head of Jeremiah, and dissonances of color like the clash here in 2nd Isaiah of oranges, greens, reds, blues, and purples. We feel Landau's pain. At the same time, we see triumph in the blazing sun, feel the intellectual edge and emotional power of his forms and images. And we sense in this his sheer joy as an artist creating in monumental stained glass works affected by the prophets themselves a visionary response to injustice. The awe we experience standing before Landau's symphony of colors in the sanctuary of Knesset Israel 
is one with the prophet's pain and joy embodied in its stained glass. And controlling the energy of his window's color vibrations in a constantly changing light, unlike any other medium, their rhythm being amplified by the sensuous black lines of leading, which his colors revel in, this is the artist's great triumph. We may experience at first the dissonances of Landau's visionary artist stressful, of which a certain measure he believed heightens awareness. Experiencing these more fully, we are struck by their rich visionary meaning that reflects the ambiguities and contradictions that the prophets wrestled with. Landau brings to a new pitch in his art the conflict between order and energy. The dazzling symphony of the prophetic quest's colors invites us, while its violently fragmented bodies and floating word balloons challenge us. And Landau desires that we make companions of these images to claim them as our own, altering our consciousness, remember? Because for prophets, it was not enough to simply record injustice, but to act. As we've seen, the prophets imagine an alternative world and exhort us to do the same. Then work toward realizing it. Seek justice. Relieve the oppressed, Isaiah demands, just as Landau works toward intensifying our responsibility to seek justice by his glorious and disturbing images. I thank you for listening. It's been such a pleasure to share my experience of these windows. And one day, treat yourself. Make a trip to Knesset, Israel, and stand before Jacob Landau's The Prophetic Quest. They'll welcome you there and be happy to give you a tour. Meanwhile, you can enjoy a book that a colleague and I have written on The Prophetic Quest, Jacob Landau's Stained Glass Windows, which will be available from Penn State University Press in March.